The world as we know it is definitely changing. We're seeing a great divide between what the Bible calls the children of light and the children of darkness. 2020 brought a lot of people a wake-up call, a wake-up call into the harsh reality that most of what we've been taught and what we know is nothing but propaganda coming from the children of darkness. But who are these children of darkness and how long have they been here on our planet? But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Also a very special thank you to all of our patrons who really help keep this channel going. If you would like to become a part of our Patreon program, the link is down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we are going to be talking about Queen Dido. following along on the Dark Outpost. Every Tuesday night, we are going through the missing Gospels of the Bible, which I then reshare here, little Cliff Notes versions on Wednesday. But before we started going through the missing Gospels of the Bible, we did a very in-depth episode on the Canaanites. The Canaanites are mentioned in all the Abrahamic religions. They are either, in some cultures, they are the offspring of Cain, and in other cultures, they are the offspring of Ham, who was the son of Noah. If anybody is familiar with their biblical studies, this ongoing war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness is really just a battle between the Israelites and the Canaanites. The Canaanites worshipped a god of death, or actually multiple gods of death. The Canaanites were notorious for committing human sacrifice, especially with their children and infants. Now, many people believe that the Canaanites are no longer here, that this is just something that happened in the past and is no longer a part of our modern day story. But that is simply not true. There's a quote that says the devil's greatest trick was convincing the world that he did not exist. And we see this with the Canaanites. You see, the Canaanites, they rule by infiltration, not invasion. And right now, many people across the world are waking up to realize that their whole government system, their education system, everything has been infiltrated by these modern day Canaanites. But how did it all begin? Well, as I said, it does come from the Bible, from the beginning of this timeline that we're living in. And they became a group of people that eventually were called the Phoenicians. Our language today is based off of a Phoenician language. That's where we get the word phonics from, right? Well, Phoenicia would be in modern day Lebanon. So these Canaanites who became Phoenicians started to rule off of this coast that backs up into the Mediterranean Sea, very close to Israel. Now the Phoenicians were seafaring people, hence why we are under, most of our countries are under maritime law. Which to get deeply into maritime law and how it affects us in our court system and our own birth certificates is definitely another topic for another day. But that's where it comes from. Now, one of the colors associated with the Phoenicians was the color or is the color purple. This has a lot to do with things that grew off the coast in Phoenicia. We also see the color purple still to this day associated with our modern day Canaanites or Phoenicians. So how did these maritime merchants from Phoenicia end 
up exploring and expanding all over the modern world. Well, it starts with a woman named Dido. Dido was born under the name Elise, and she was a princess of Phoenicia in the city of Tyre. Her father, King Matin, died around 800 BC, and when he died, he declared that he wanted his children to co-rule. So Princess Elisa was there to co-rule with her brother Pygmalion. Now Pygmalion was a bit of a brute, a bit of a psychopath, and he decided that he wanted all the power for himself. Oddly enough, the people of Phoenician also wanted Pygmalion to be their sole king. In the meantime, Elisa was married off to her uncle. Just a side note, these Phoenicians today still practice incest, so this has been happening since the beginning of time for them. But nonetheless, she married her uncle who was a high priest of Phoenicia. Her uncle was also very powerful. He had a lot of gold and authority because of his status in the city. While well, Elisa's power-hungry brother, Pygmalia, could not have this, and so he had his uncle brother-in-law killed. The story goes that soon after Pygmalion killed his sister's husband, who was also their uncle, the uncle, husband, brother-in-law then appeared to Elisa in a dream telling her what happened. He then told her where his money was hidden and that she needed to go collect the money and get out of town because her brother was planning on assassinating her as well. Lalisa rounded up a bunch of noblemen and they got their boats together and they set out on the Mediterranean. Along the way, they stopped at different locations and picked up some virgins so that the noblemen would have wives to mate with. They eventually landed on the northern coast of Africa in modern day Tunisia. At this point, Elisa, who was quite wealthy, docked off of the boat and met up with the local people. She offered to buy some land from them for an ox hide. This land became known as the new city, or Carthage, as we know it today. Carthage very quickly grew in size and grew in wealth, and rumors about this magnificent city spread all over the ancient world. There was also rumors about Elisa's beauty. Now at this point, her name had been changed to Dido because Dido means wanderer. So now she was known as Queen Dido of Carthage. Because of her great beauty, great wealth, and savvy uh, biz business skills to buy land and create her own city, many of the surrounding kings wanted to marry Dido. Now, she always declined these offers because she felt like if she married a foreign king, then her people would then be ruled by a foreign country. Now, one important thing about the Canaanites or the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians are the people, the Canaanites living in Carthage now, is that they practiced a Canaanite religion. These Canaanite religions are the religions of the children of, of darkness. They worship the gods of the dead. The children of light worship the living God. But because they worship a god of the dead, they participate in human sacrifice. This is very normal. In fact, you can watch a lot of archaeologists speak about this in what we have, the ruins of Carthage now, all the bodies that have been found. In fact, from 800 BC to 146 BC, when the Roman Empire took over Carthage, there were about 20,000 corpses of infants that had been sacrificed. A lot of wealthy parents would sacrifice a baby just to ensure their family's wealth. It must suck to worship a god that forces you to give up something in order to obtain satisfaction in the end. Now, if you did join us on the Dark Outpost when we went over the Canaanites, you do know that in Carthage, they also practiced sacred prostitution where parents would send their daughters, their virgin daughters to a temple in order to be um, R-A-P-E-D by a certain priest or monks or people coming into the town. This still happens today. Just think about the movie Eyes Wide Shut. Now I had to spell that word because YouTube will censor this video if I said it as it is. 
So back to Queen Dido. Now, in my opinion, she could have just con continued to turn down all these suitors that wanted to marry her. But instead, she felt like she needed to commit a sacrifice, a human sacrifice, in order to ensure the prosperity of her new city. So she put out a memo, an ancient memo, to everybody in Carthage saying that there would be a sacrifice soon to be there at a specific time and date. While these people showed up to witness the sacrifice, thinking it would be, you know, some other person that they were going to sacrifice or an animal, but it turned out that Dido herself was going to sacrifice herself to these Canaanite gods to ensure her city would be prosperous. The story goes that she shoved a sword into her stomach while standing on top of a funeral pyre as it burned her body to a crisp. Her ashes then scattered amongst her city of Carthage. Now, obviously, Carthage lasted for a very long time after the death of Queen Dido, the founder of the city. For about 600 years, Carthage dominated the Mediterranean Sea. They were the merchants. In fact, Carthage turned into what we would consider America in that time. People knew of all this wealth going on in Carthage through all the merchants. And so people were moving to Carthage just to try to get a piece of the pie. In fact, because of the overwhelming demand for space for all the new immigrants coming in, Carthage was the first ancient city to start to build apartments. Now, as Carthage was growing, Phoenicia was falling. But again, that doesn't really matter because most of the Phoenicians started making their way over to Carthage anyway. In 574 BC, Tyre and Phoenicia did fall to the Babylonians again, forcing Carthage to now be the capital city of these Canaanite people. And again, this city of Carthage was a city dedicated to the Canaanite gods. Again, hence why they had so many sacrifices there. Now the city center, the main focal point of Carthage was its harbor. Its harbor had two sections. The first section was for the merchants. And so the boats would pull in and they would sell their goods. It was like the modern day promenade or modern day mall for people. Well, the second section of, of this harbor was for the military ships, what we would call our Navy today. And from what historians said, these Canaanites, these Phoenicians were so good at building boats and understanding how to make boats of a machine of battle that they would open the gates and these military boats would just whoosh, 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 shoot out, basically threatening any type of invader that wanted to come and take over the city. Now, again, as you know, from our episode on the Dark Outpost, the Roman Empire at this time, as well as the Greeks, were not fans of Carthage. They thought that these Phoenician Canaanites were completely barbaric. Why did they think they were barbaric? Because they practiced human sacrifice. Of course, the Romans and the Greek also worshipped a pantheon of gods. However, at this point, they did not do the same type of rituals that the Canaanites did. However, we do know that eventually the Roman Empire would turn into a Canaanite empire where they did do human sacrifice. So what happened? Well, infiltration happened. In 264 BC, the first of many wars called the Punic Wars started. This started over the island of Sicily. Now, because of Sicily's location in the Mediterranean Sea, Sicily was a very important place for merchants. And obviously, merchants bring money into a country. It boosts the economy. We know now Sicily is a part of Italy. It's very close to what would have been the Roman Empire. And both the Romans and the Carthaginians had men, troops, on this island. And of course, a war broke out. I don't think the Roman Empire was expecting to come out on top of this war, and perhaps they really didn't. The history books will tell you that the Roman Empire eventually won, and that's what got rid of Carthage. However, 
if you look even closer at the truth of the situation, it was the Car Carthage people who won. They just infiltrated the Roman Empire. And over time, even though the city of Carthage started to decline, the Roman Empire started to grow. It seems everywhere that the Canaanites went, prosperity happened, and they continued to slowly infiltrate their satanic beliefs onto the customs of the people. Eventually, these customs and beliefs made it into the Celtic people, and they started sacrificing humans. We do believe that the Phoenicians were the first people to come to America 1,500 years before Christopher Columbus, and we know from looking at Jekyll Island and the Federal Reserve that there were human sacrifices happening on that island that very much mimicked what was happening in Carthage. And as time went by and centuries passed, the stories of Carthage became ancient knowledge. We were none the wiser that these people were still participating in their faith, just like they had in the days of Queen Dido. However, as we start to awaken to the truth and we understand what actually happened on a particular island, we know that these people that the media has highlighted as being fantastic are nothing but the children of darkness. That since the beginning of time, they've decided to worship a god of death. While we, the good people of the earth, the children of light, are absolutely appalled by what we have learned and have been fighting ever since to stop it. Now it is written in the Bible as well as other religious texts that at the end of time, of this time, these children of darkness will not succeed. We talked about this with the war scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the children of light would succeed and eradicate the children of darkness off this planet. I personally believe that right now we are in the tail end of this battle where everything seems to be a little bit darker than before because all of the muckiness is coming up to be cleansed and wiped away. They also say it's darkest before the dawn. And if we just hold on for a little bit longer, we will see the light over the horizon. We know that our history books have been altered. We know that a lot of our religious texts have been altered. They've been altered by these Canaanites. And I will tell you, the more that I research this stuff, the more fascinating our history truly is. When you start to connect the dots of what actually happened to us, man, it does tell a very fascinating story. And as we move forward into truth and to light, hopefully we will be at a place where we can start to correct the mistakes of our ancestors so that future generations will live in a more peaceful and a more loving world. All right, guys, thank you so much for sitting through another video. On Monday, I will bring you another mystery. This one is a recommendation from Adam. We're gonna be moving into France again, so that should be a fun one. Again, I am setting up some interviews. Some interviews I wanna do, one I wanna do with Adam because he has written a novel about multiverses and he knows a lot about multiverses and that's what I wanna interview him on. A snippet of his novel is down in the description box below. And as always, if any of you know anybody in publication, that would want to look at Adam's work and maybe get in touch with Adam to help him get his stuff published, his email address is also down in the description box below. I am also working on interviewing David Zublik for you guys just to learn more about him and how he ended up on this path. A lot of you came to my channel from David Zublik. So if you have any questions that you want me to ask David, please email them to me at esotericatlanta at gmail.com. Again, that email address is also in the description box as well. All right, thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase our opening song, that is also in the description box below. And thank you to Todd Broderick for helping me edit this and get this out to you guys on this awesome Friday morning. All right, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.